Hi, and welcome to the Dark Web Vlogs, where I'm sharing the experiences I've had working with clients on some of the most outrageous deals being run over the dark web. It's funny how factual events and things can get turned into stories, urban legends, and campfire tales. Seems almost anything, if you think about it, could be twisted into something haunting or something to fear. We like to be scared when we're in the mood. And we like those types of tales, you know, the ones we know aren't really true or harmful. They are the safe scared, and it's fun, even invigorating. Well, I'm not here today to tell you some sort of made-up scary tale or urban legend. What I am here to do, though, is tell you the truth about one of them. When I see an interest out there in a certain topic, if I've worked with it, I just may have a job to share around that very thing. And today, that's what I'm going to do. The job has to do with that creepy urban legend around those creepy black-eyed kids that no one ever wants to let in. They call me the ghost. I'm ex-CIA and now a dark operative on the dark web. I've worked a lot of jobs, and today is a story about one of them that revealed secrets about the real black-eyed beings and what happened to a widow with nowhere else to turn. Take a listen and enjoy. This request. Okay, well, when I got this request, I remember just sitting there and wondering what it was really all about. This request was different due to the fact that it did not come from the person needing assistance. Well, not the person being directly affected by what was going on. Although parts of what was going on did relate to those who sent this in. I know that probably doesn't make sense yet. But the request came to me from a cardinal at the Vatican. He says that he's coming to me on behalf of the Pope after one of their cases proved to go beyond what they could offer. They say that dark dealings from many years ago have now taken on a new form here on Earth, and there is someone that they would like me to visit. Quite simply, and without much detail at all, this is a request for me to visit a woman in Hinsdale, New York. That's east and south of Niagara Falls, just so you kind of know what that is. And whatever this request is, is a big enough problem that it already went through them, and now they're reaching out to me. And I have a lot of questions, but I also plan on going because I know this must be something serious. So I let them know that I'm going to check it out. You know, I confirm that I will head to New York to find out what's going on. Before I actually leave, though, I get a follow-up message from the Vatican telling me to go cautiously. So I take note of that. The request included all the details I need to get there. And after I get all my things in order, I talk to my team, I get packed up, and I'm on my way. I go to meet this woman, and I'm going straight to where she lives, which is a small farm. When I get there, I can see that it's pretty old. It doesn't really look like it's been taken care of, at least not for a while. All right, well, I drive up, and I get out, and I mean, instantly, I get this odd vibe. I mean, turn, and I look around, because it was almost like someone was there, like someone was close by. And then when I shut the door to my car, it was really weird. It was like when I shut that door, I had committed, or something had changed felt a small flash of extra quiet, some kind of shift or something. Not really like a deja vu, but strange like that. The entire front of the main level of the house is a deck, and it has this almost archway at the top of the stairs to enter it. I mean, it's really impressive. It's just kind of old and run down. There's a deck off the second level as well. It's white, a worn white. Anyway, I get to the front door, and that's black, and there's a window on either side of it. And Before I even knock, I see someone moving this shear and peeking through the curtain in the window to my left. It's the woman. She looks and then she disappears. So I lower my hand from walking and I just kind of wait. This woman does it again and then I hear some sounds at the door and she actually opens it. She looks about 40, but a really good 40. She looks a little disheveled and she looks at me and she just asks if I'm her, if I'm the one from the Vatican. Well, I tell her, yes, I'm her, but no, I'm not from the Vatican. Although I work with them on certain things. And, you know, understandably, this woman looks skeptical. And I don't really want her to boot me out before I even have a chance to find out what's up. So I just go ahead and tell her, you know, she can trust me. That the Vatican trusts me, thinking, you know, that she must trust them or whoever was here. And I just tell her I'd like to come in and learn about her problem and that I want to help. She steps aside, doesn't say anything, but she just starts walking back into her house. So I follow her. This house isn't small either. I can see that it must have been quite the thing in its time, though. It's impressive. It's just really run down. I can see that 
they or someone has been working on it at some point, but they don't seem to be working on it now. Anyway, I follow her into this room off to the side and there's this old desk and a couch and things and we just sit down and she starts talking. She's looking down at her cup of tea and she blinks a few times and she starts to get into it. She just blurts out that they are coming for her, that they already have. She's running out of strength and time. And that's why she called the priest, but they couldn't help her. With her husband gone, she's alone and she feels vulnerable and scared. So I dare to ask her, where is her husband? Well, she explains that he died in a car crash just six months ago. What's happened since is why she called the priest. She pulls up this blanket on her chair and wraps herself in it and then goes into it a little bit more. So they're in this new house that's been in her husband's family for a very long time. All she really knew about it was that it had to stay in the family. He was very excited about it. But then after everything, you know, leaving their old lives behind and starting to settle, well, he gets into this car accident and he dies. And after he died, she did what any wife would do. And she says she was strong then, you know, she'd have no reason to wait for anything. So while still in shock, even she started to sort through the things in the house. And that's when she says she discovered what's in the attic. And then she kind of gets off track or she just starts to kind of ramble on. And at first I think she's just all over the place, but she actually did have a point, although it was a bit confusing at first. She tells me that they missed him and that now they're after her. She looks up at me and her eyes are glossed over and she looks a little bit crazy. And she tells me that they only come at night and the house, the house is a magnet that she should have left right then after her husband passed, but she didn't know. And now she was stuck there. I asked what she meant and she said that physically she could not leave. And she can see that there's more explaining to do. So she gathers up her blanket and herself and walks over to the kitchen and the door in the back. And I follow her and when she gets there, she just stares at the door. I'm looking at her and it seems that she wants to go out. So I slowly open the door and then I open the screen door and I step out onto the small porch out back. And I'm just standing there looking at her and she's just inside the house. She grabs onto her blanket even tighter and starts to walk toward the entrance, almost ready to step outside, but then her leg starts to shake. She backs away, almost stumbling, and then falls into the chair in the kitchen. Her head is down, but when she puts it up, I see her nose is bleeding. I grab a towel, I bring it over to her, and that's when she says, the curse has me, I am not allowed to leave. And then in a desperate voice, she says, she will die there. She cleans herself up and then sets the towel down. I sit down at the table with her, And she starts to talk about the priest. Well, there were three priests actually all together. And the last one was sent from the Vatican because nothing was getting resolved. So it was escalated. She was sure the house was haunted, but there was nothing that the priest could do. And they explained to her that they would send someone, but that this was more than a possession. Whatever this was did not want to take her over. It wanted to take her out. The priest told her that the house was cursed. And so now things are starting to make sense to me. And of course, they must have known that I would figure it out and now Here I am looking around. If the house is cursed, that's much more than an exorcism could handle. Not that there's not evil at work here. There simply just isn't one spirit to remove. It's a curse. There's a presence that's taking over. After the last priest left, she was still of solid mind and she decided that she would do more searching. Surely there must have been something that her husband knew. He was obsessed with this house. And that brings us back to the attic. Now, I'm ready to just get up into that attic right now because I want to see what's up there and I want to try to put all the pieces together, but she has something else to tell me. She tells me that it's the children. And I'm thinking, the children? She tells me that the third time they came, she watched them and that's when she recognized the one. She recognized one of the children from something she saw in the attic. I can see that she's starting to drift again. So I bring her back and I tell her that she just needs to show me the attic. And when we get up there, there's stuff everywhere. Most things are in order, but there's this chest that has been pulled out to the middle of the room and it's open and there are things all around it. It looks like they were gone through in a hurry or maybe frantically, which is probably the case. So she drops her blanket and goes over to this small wooden table that has a book on it. And she opens it and points to a picture that's inside of it and tells me that that's the one. That's the boy that she saw. So I go over and look at it and I see a picture that has three young boys in it standing in a field somewhere. And she points to the one in the middle, tells me that's the one, that's the boy she saw. And she looks at me and tells me that the only difference was the one she saw, his eyes were black, all black. And when she saw him, it sent a terror through her body and she can't even explain it. She says that that is what's going to be what tears her apart. So I'm trying to get my head around it like so many of my jobs, you know, nothing's normal. The only thing that sounds familiar here is the legend of the black eyed kids. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, is that what this is? 
any legend can have a starting point. I mean, and although people have a lot of fun with it today, it doesn't mean that it wasn't real at some point. Or is it still real at this time? I'm not all the way ready to jump into that idea, but like always, I'm keeping that open. And I just remind her that this picture is dated from 1907 and that there's no way that boy could have been standing on her front porch. But she tells me that he was, and she's certain that he was. And if I stick around, I will see him again that night. She tells me that she started reading through the things that she uncovered in that chest. And if she was right, her husband was cursed. But then he died. And because they could not get to him first before that happened, you know, they missed him. They missed their chance. And so she's sure that because that happened, they're now coming for her. She tells me that they'll never leave her alone until they get what they came for. Well, I start going through some of the things that she already has out. And I see writings from a very long time ago, even before 1907. And there is a mention of a curse. And there's a log that has people listed and things that happened and things about the house. It becomes even more clear to me why the Vatican called on me. And this is going to take some research and something's going to have to be handled here. But I don't really have my head around exactly what it is quite yet. I get a hold of my team and we get things arranged and Frankie, Scarlett, and Harley will join me at the house. Jagger and Ryder are coming too, but Jagger's going to stay in town and kind of watch things and be a runner if we need him. And Ryder will just hold down the base, a base in town where we can all go to if we need to. I have no idea what I'm dealing with yet. And so I pull my whole team in so that we can be ready for anything. So with them on their way, I stay at the house with Amy. Although Amy's not going to leave the house and apparently can't, I do get out and walk the property, at least the homestead. And I've learned that this house was built in 1898. It's been through a few renovations, but clearly needs another one. The farm hasn't been worked in years, but it's easy to imagine this place up and working and prosperous. Looks like it was very nice at one time. Well, Amy and I get through the evening hours okay. You know, we eat, we sit, we chat, although Amy is pretty disconnected. I learned a little bit more about what she believes. Somehow there's a curse that has followed her husband's bloodline for many years. Somehow something is out to get anyone directly in that line. But now her husband has died. And this was unexpected, again, making her the target. She's the closest one connected to his family, to him. In the house, she explains that at first the house was welcoming. She felt good there. She was more than happy to pick up her life and move there. And it was her husband's dream and everything seemed to be pleasant and nice. But as soon as her husband passed, Again, it was a sudden thing. Everything changed. The house took on a feeling of darkness. She didn't feel safe. She found also that she was unable to leave. I mean, in the beginning when she could leave, by the time she would get into town to buy groceries or whatever she was doing, she would be sick. She said she vomited behind the pharmacy one time. She had to pull over while she was driving one time because she was too dizzy to see. And soon she just realized that she couldn't leave at all. She has her groceries and stuff delivered every two weeks, and she just stays there by herself right now, feeling like a prisoner. As for the priests, there was something blocking what they were trying to do. Whatever had moved into that house had spread or was bigger than one ill-intended spirit, and she was losing hope, although she was glad I was there. She really didn't feel, though, that there was anything I could do. She was pretty much at the end of her rope, I mean, losing all hope, and she was exhausted. She was ready to give in. But I just assure her that it isn't over yet. And when my team gets there, we're going to figure out what to do. And so we waited out. And she had this big grandfather clock near the front room. And I just remember hearing that thing ticking. Just a lot of time going by in silence. And there's this big clock ticking away. But then we're startled out of it when there's a knock at the door. And it's late now. Amy jumps out of her seat. I mean, it's the fastest she's moved since I had gotten there. I get up as well as if something's about to happen. But... She runs over to me and grabs my arms and tells me that, no, I cannot answer the door. I mean, she's panicking that I'm just going to run over and open it. She tells me they can't come in, and she's literally pleading with me not to answer the door. And I tell her we don't have to, but why don't we go look so she can show me what's really going on out there? So she takes me over to the front room, and there are no lights on, so we have a good view of what's outside. And I see down in the moonlight there are four children. They're all standing on the porch. They're all dressed in black. Three of them have blonde hair, and one of them is a brunette. They're all sort of looking down at their shoes and then to the door. Then one of them turns to the side, checking out the porch, and I see it. There's no doubt this kid's eyes are completely black. Amy points to one of the blonde children. She tells me that there, that's the one. That's the one in the photograph. And I mean, I don't have the photograph right there in front of me, so I can't be 100% certain. 
But I am pretty amazed because from what I saw, this boy does look like the boy in the photograph. Well, the kids knock again and again and again. And we just sit and wait it out. And eventually they do turn around and they walk off into the field. And as they walk away, Amy starts to get violently sick. I mean, she's coughing. She's spitting things up. Again, her nose starts to bleed. So I run into the bathroom and I get her some tissues. And we go through that whole process again. And as we're doing that, there's another knock at the door. Well, I go back to the front room, half expecting to see those children coming back. But it's my team. They have finally arrived. Amy seems to panic at first when I go for the door, but I explain to her that it's okay, and this is more help for us. And, okay, so now, to avoid rambling on myself, you know, I'd go on until I have, like, a two-hour video. I'm going to sum up a few things for you here. My team and I go into the very late hours, researching and reading and going through everything we can that is a part of that chest in the attic. And here's what came of that. These children, if what we're reading is correct, are from many years ago before leaving the picture in 1907, way back when religions were getting sorted out and people were taking sides. There was also this cult, if you will. Yep, they even had cults back then. And if people tried to leave that cult, they would become instant traitors. They were not free to leave. From what we can tell, this cult or group stemmed from evil. They were trying to convert members and get a better hold on people and grow a presence over anyone here on earth. Well, an almost mini war started and there were small battles with those trying to get out or escape. And as the cult took people out, what was left behind were the children. And as I'm sure you can guess, the children were taken. These children, for however many years this was going on, are still out there and their eyes are black as they're taken over with some sense of evil. And their purpose? To take out those with any link to the original bloodline of those traitors, where this all started. So of course this young boy that's in the picture is from back then, from the beginning. And Amy's husband is in that bloodline. At least that's what many of the journals we read tell us. I mean, Amy's husband, and I'll call him Derek, is in this bloodline, okay? So if they were gonna get him, they would want to sabotage his life. Maybe he would come down with some illness. Maybe he would get chronically ill. Maybe he would go mad. But no matter what the case, his life then would be altered and his progress would be hindered on this earth. But he ruined that plan, or the accident did. By getting in that car accident, the plan was interrupted. But they still have a mission to complete. And so Amy becomes the new target. It's all starting to make sense. We also learned that why the house is so important is because it was blessed many, many years ago. It was a place of safety from this curse. The many fathers that came before Derek kept the house in the family because they understood. Apparently, Derek, he understood as well, but he just never shared this information with Amy. She would have known she never would have wanted to move there. And really, if she would have known any of this, she says she wouldn't have married Derek in the first place. But she did love him, and now here she was, scared for her life. Okay, so we have all the information we can get. We spent that entire evening into the morning going through everything in that attic that came from that chest that has to do with this issue. And there are some other interesting things that we found. One, the children, which we know are leftover casualties basically from years ago, are led by someone. They have a leader. We need to find that leader. We take a closer look at those logs and find out more about what happened to Der Derek's family back then and how they were affected. I mean, some of them went mad, took their own lives. Some of them ran off into the woods and were never seen again. Some fought against the families they once loved. Others went numb and never spoke another word. They were catatonic. In any case, their lives were never the same. They were halted, stunted against any further growth. Another thing is that it clearly states in some of the writings that they cleansed this house that we're in at some point. And that's what made it safe. Somehow with Eric dying and Amy being completely clueless, there was a weak point and that's how they must have gotten to her. But the point is, is that at one time the house was clean of evil and was safe, a place that could reject the evil. But now that's changed and we need to cleanse it again. In those journals, they talked of a dark healer. And it takes us a while, but through our own research, we do find that there are still these types of healers that exist today. And there's one that we find in this small town in the southeastern corner of New Mexico. There are also some across the globe, but it's not looking like we have time for that. So we're going to give this one a shot. I leave Harley to keep an eye on Amy and I leave Frankie to keep an eye on the house itself. And I take Scarlett with me and we head to New Mexico. 
We get to this lady's place and she's out there a ways. You know, it's very dry and dusty. There's really nothing else around, but we come upon this southwestern looking border to this property with an iron gate. So we make our way through that and we see this small bungalow up ahead. When we get there and knock, this tiny little lady comes to the door. She's wearing her up on her head, wrapped in a scarf. The dress she has on goes to the floor. She's covered in beaded jewelry, big gold earrings hanging down. We don't even get anything out of our mouths yet. And she tells us that she sensed we were coming. She urges us inside where she says she has been getting things ready for us. This woman takes us over to a small area in the back corner in back of her place where she has some incense burning. She has pillows set up. So we each take a pillow on the ground and we sit down. She looks at both of us and tells us that the evil is getting a stronger foothold. Like she already knows something about what's going on. She can sense the anger coming from it. And she knows that they have a mission they're trying to complete. Well, we explain our full situation while she gets to work and she breaks out all kinds of little bottles and pouches. She has hair from a goat and the blood of a pig. I mean, she had a ton of stuff and she's packaging all this stuff up for us and explaining to us that we what we need to do to cleanse the house. We need to cover all the mirrors and the clocks because time and our own identities can distract from the tasks at hand. And it's only us and them. Nothing else matters. We're dealing with something that only knows of their goals and that's power. She then gets done mixing up this concoction that she says Amy must drink and everything went in it, except for the goat hair, which she said we need to light on fire and have it slowly burn in the center of the room, wherever we're at, which will be in the house, obviously. We need to draw lines of this powder and drop it in front of each entrance of the home and each window. And finally, she goes over to how the evil must be cleared from Amy. She gives us this large canister of this white powder and tells us to draw a circle around her with her enclosed inside. She will have to draw her own blood and drop points of it at equal, equal distances around herself. And then there are a few other things, you know, things for her to say, other things for her to do. But together, the combination of everything that she gives us and tells us, she said the house and Amy should be cleansed when we are done. But then I asked her, what about the children? She tells us that what we have learned is true that they have been prisoners since way back in the past and that they're being used as soldiers to take down and punish those in family lines that had nothing really to do with what happened back then. She held up her hand, motioning for us to wait for a minute. She gets up and goes inside her house and comes back with a whole bunch of things that she's now going to mix up in this large bowl. She's dropping things into it and mixing it all together, pounding them, grinding them until she has kind of this runny paste. She pours it and scrapes it into a larger bottle and tells us that for each kid that we can swipe the divine line on, they will have a chance. Once we wipe the line, we need to cover their eyes. And she gives us a few lines of a saying that we need to say to each and every one of them individually. I mean, I don't even know how many there are, but I'm willing to give all of this a chance. And our job is technically to help Amy, but there's clearly a bigger problem here. And I want to do what we can. So we get done with the dark healer. We head back to New York. And when we get there, it seems that Things have been pretty busy while we were gone, and Frankie gives me the lowdown. You know, the black-eyed kids were relentless. They came the night that we were away, and they didn't leave so quickly. They went to the front door, they went to the back door, and then they just stood on the porch for the longest time. With Harley watching Amy, Frankie took it upon himself to find out exactly where they always run off to. When they finally retreated and went back into the fields, he followed them. And on the other side of the field, which is now basically just a bunch of weeds, there was this small stream and they followed that for a short ways until they come upon this tree. It's hidden by lots of branches and bushes at the bottom. But when you really take a look at it, if it was cleared, you would look out of place. I mean, the roots were enormous, spreading and reaching out into every bush around it. And each one of those children, again, there were four of them, they ducked down under one of the giant roots. And the closer Frankie looked at it, it almost looked like the tree itself was a cover because the roots were so big and they were everywhere. And then each of the kids ducked down under the one and they disappeared down into it. Well, Frankie's kind of a big guy, but he did make it through that hole. He waited a minute after the children went in and then he followed. He said it was this musty tunnel, damp and dark. But the farther in he went, it started to open up until it finally dropped down into this underground dirt for walls room. It was deep. And he watched as each of the four kids climbed down into it. And when he himself caught up, 
He was amazed. Says there was a sea of children. There had to be at least 300 of them. And then what amazed him even more is what he saw at the center. There was a man, very prominent eyebrows, dark hair, wearing a black suit. It was obvious to Frankie, and it's obvious to me when I hear it, that this is one of those leaders, the leaders the writings talked about. This person, this man, or whatever this is, is the head of it all. They're directing the children for their purpose. The children at that point probably aren't even aware of. Frankie did not stick around because our top priority mission at the moment is Amy. He wanted to wait until Scarlett and I returned. Well, when we get back, we get that update from Frank, and then we also get an update from Harley, who explains to me that Amy is extremely fragile at this point, that with all the pressure, she's breaking. We need to work fast. So we set up everything that the dark healer gave us, and it takes us a while getting it all set up, protecting every doorway, every window. And then as we're getting everything set up, you know, we get Amy inside her chalk circle. There's a banging at the front door, not just a knocking, a banging. The kids were outside and they were really banging on the door hard. We find ourselves, you know, we're all just standing, staring at the front door, half expecting them to bust right through it, but they don't. Then without warning though, the front door is ripped from its hinges, just starts to shake, the screws start to rattle, and the door is basically sucked away from the house and it flies out onto the homestead lawn. Now, we can see the kids at this point. They're standing right in the doorway. They're just in a line looking inside. The little brunette kid asks if they can come in. We don't say anything back to them, but he just keeps asking, explaining different things, you know, like he needs to call his parents or they need to come in to warm up. You know, any excuse you can think of. But as we learned from the dark healer, the best thing to do is to just ignore them. We can't shut the door, but we can ignore them. So Scarlet keeps going. She's heating up the special blend of tea that Amy will need to drink as Amy is continuing to surround herself with drops of her own blood now. I make sure that she understands not to leave that circle until we're done. I'm not sure what's about to happen, but I want her to stay there. Frank and I go back to the door. Not to really do anything with the children, but we just kind of want to see what they're up to, check them out. And as we get closer, they stop asking to come in. And actually, they don't say another word. Well, Frankie stays there and keeps watch while I go back over to where Amy is. Scarlett and I get to work again on the cleansing ritual to clear the house and Amy of this evil it's been working its way in. Well, the weather seems to have been brewing outside. You know, it's getting darker. And as we get to the final stage of it all, by the time Amy's ready to drink her tea, there's a full-blown storm outside. I mean, there's rain, thunder, lightning. We look to the kids and now instead of four, there are eight. And they're standing at the outer edge of the porch now in a line. Two of the glass windows in the living room that we're in start to crack. And then they shatter and the wind and rain comes into the room, like the house is almost folding under pressure of some kind. Well, Scarlett and I keep repeating the things given to us by the dark healer, and Amy starts to drink her tea. The storm now feels like it's literally inside of the house, but Amy keeps going, and so do we. Frankie's still watching the outside, but every time he goes from looking at us to looking at them, they're about five feet further away from the house than they were the last time. They move from the front of the door to the back of the porch to the front of the lawn and now farther out each time. I mean, they're always standing in the same line, but they're farther away. After Amy drinks her tea, the lightning and the wind dies down. We wait a little bit longer and then we just wait it out until really all we hear is some thunder in the distance. And then whatever was in that tea made Amy extremely drowsy. So... It looks like things are done. Together, we move her over to the small couch in that other room off to the side. It's smaller, feels more secure. The windows are still intact. Frankie lets us know that the line of children is backing off now. They're now at the very edge of the property before you get to the fields. With Amy lying down, I leave Scarlett and Harley to watch over her, and Frankie and I decide to go for it. Frankie's already told me about the dirt cavern, and I have all the items given to me by the dark healer, so we will go to the dark cavern and see what we can find and see if there's anything we can do. I mean, I'm thinking about these kids, and I start to wonder, you know, how awful it would be. Do the kids know what's going on, or have they lost their souls? We can only hope that they're not aware But if we can get to them, maybe we can bring them out of this. You know, like I said, I have everything the dark healer gave me. And I'm hoping there's something we can do to help here. We go to the fields and we go for quite a ways. It's still raining. So we're, you know, we're starting to get pretty much soaked at this point. But 
Frankie assures me that it's not too far ahead and we just keep going. And sure enough, after a while, we get to where this big root tree is. And I mean, the roots, he's right. They're hard to see at first. They're really well disguised under all the bushes. We watch as each kid, one by one, ducks down into this thing. And I mean, the innocence, you know, how these kids look, they're how innocent they appear is really deceiving because you can just feel the evil in them. It's like it's reaching out to you. It's really creepy. Well, as the last of them went in, their jacket gets caught on one of the branches that's, you know, all around these roots. And as he ducks down in to follow the others, his jacket gets pulled and something falls out of his pocket. Well, we move in to go get it and we find it's a very shiny black rock. And not big enough to fill up the palm of your hand, really, but bigger than a quarter, if that gives you an idea. And this black rock has been carved into a block pentagon star. And I mean, this thing is as black as the kid's eyes. There seems to also be some kind of energy coming from it. I mean, as I'm holding it in my hand, my hand's actually tingling. So I just take it and I stuff it into a pouch uh, in my backpack. And Frankie and I keep going. Inside... Frankie was right. It's damp. It's full of moss and wet twigs and branches. The walls are made of dirt. The floor is covered all in rocks. I mean, it's not really the easiest place to walk quietly in, but we make our way. We get to the large room, and I mean, I'm just in awe. Again, Frankie was right. It is a sea of children. Little heads and black outfits everywhere. And in the center is the man Frankie told me about. He's talking to the kids, telling them about the importance of their mission and how they can't be stopped. He warns them that there is a resistance, a resistance that absolutely must be stopped because it's in the way of them continuing their work on the ones that betrayed them a long time ago. He's going on and on, but then he suddenly stops and he literally sniffs the air. He pauses and he starts making his way through the kids, going in a few different directions, and he's just sniffing the air. And then he says, and it's clear now that he's actually talking directly to us, Frankie and I. He says that we will not win. He tells the kids to take cover and he starts throwing his hands in different directions. And each time he does, a flash of lightning extends out of his hands and hits the walls, the floor, causing little explosions. We see that he too has black eyes. We learned back at the house that these leaders have also existed for hundreds of years and they're the keepers of the children. It is their mission to continue to take out those down the line of the family members that came before them the traitors, the ones that are seen as a threat. This leader calls out for us and tells us to show ourselves if we think we are so strong. Well, of course, we do nothing, not yet. Well, he gets no response from us, and then he does something that we did not expect. He calls on the children. He tells them to spread out and find us, to bestow on us the curse that was reserved for the family lines because we are now an extension of them. Well, Frankie keeps his eyes out, and I scramble to dig through what the dark healer gave me. I mean, all we can do is try to arm ourselves with what we've got. Well, two little boys actually find us, but before they can call out or make a move, I force my way in, and I draw the lines on their foreheads. I swipe the lines, and then I back them up against the wall with my hands, and I cover their eyes and repeat what the dark healer told me to say. I call out to rid them of the curse, and then I go through the three specific lines that she gave me. May the forces lift their hold. May you be set free. May you walk into the light as it should be. Now, at the same time, I don't know what exactly is even supposed to happen here, but something does start to happen. The kids look up to me, their eyes black as coal. They look evil. They look like they could take me over just with their evil eyes alone. But then the black starts to fade. One kid has eyes of blue and the other brown. And those colors start to show through. And the stern and evil expressions on their faces seem to soften. And just for a small second, I see the innocence of young children. But then, just as one of them reaches out to me, right before my eyes, they fade away. They fade into absolutely nothing. They're just gone. Now, the dark healer did say that this ritual would send them home. But, I mean, there wasn't a ton of room for a lot of questions in the short time we spent with her. So I can only guess and hope that they're either sent back to their time of existence or that they've been sent to rest in peace where their actual bodies lie. Another girl comes by and I'm able to do the same thing, but then everything changes. The black-eyed leader calls everyone back to the center of this cavern, and the dirt walls start to swell with water, to the point that it's almost like rain is seeping through them. The floors are filling up with water. I mean, this place will flood if this continues. 
As the kids file into the center of this room, the tall man makes his way through them. He's headed in our direction. The man's getting closer. Now, Frankie he just rips one of the roots off the wall and holds it in his hand like a bat, even though we both know that with whatever this guy is, that's probably not going to help too much. And when he reaches us, he stops, but he's still talking, talking directly to us. He tells us that they can't be stopped, that over hundreds of years, they've never been stopped and will not stop them now. To the left, you know, around this route that I'm behind, I'm listening to him and I'm looking out at some of the children and thinking, you know, they all need to be sent home and freed of this. But right now we have to deal with this man and this problem. He definitely has us at a disadvantage too, and that needs to change. So I step out from behind the root and I approach him. And I swear this man grew in size the closer that I got to him. I find myself looking straight up at him. And his harsh words stop and he just looks at me. And he looks over to where Frankie is and he comes out. So now we're both standing there and this man is just looking down at us, not saying anything. I mean, this guy was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. His features are strong and his eyes are so dark. I mean, if they can even be more black than black is, that's what his eyes were. Well, I reach down and get some of my mixture and I put it on, get it on my fingers and I hold my hand out to him, repeating the words from the dark healer again, like I did on the children. And I just keep my hand up and I keep repeating the words. I start to feel that this man is getting some kind of hold on me. You know, and then I'm actually lifted up off the floor just a bit. Well, Frankie moves in closer. And I mean, it's very obvious. You can see the rage building up in this man. I can see his teeth as he clenches his jaw. Well, in a quick move, Frankie wipes his hand against mine, taking the mixture. And although the tall man tried to move out of the way, Frankie did manage to get some of it on his face where the mixture hit his skin. It then lit up with a red glow and he screams out, actually. He put his hand to his face as if he was in pain and he lets out this large moan. Then he looks down at me and then he moved super fast. Not like anything normal, you know, not like he did when he was walking over to us. It's like he turned around and with one big swoosh, he was back in the center of the room. He was telling the kids to stand at attention. He was telling them that it was time to go. We didn't know what was going on and what was going to happen really, but we rushed into the room after him. As the tall man was talking and preaching, he's raising his arms up and he's saying a lot of different things, some of it in a language that we don't even recognize. You know, I start running up to the kids on the edge and I physically turn them around and I'm swiping their foreheads and covering their eyes and repeating the words. Well, I got to six of them before the tall man finished and then it was all over. His voice got extremely loud and he's asking to be removed from this place and to return another day. When he raised his hands and put his arms out to the side again, it was the last time. He let out this sickening and low sounding groan it turned into this laugh. It was a laugh I'll never forget. It was loud. And then there was this pressure that took over the room. It was a physical pressure. It was very heavy and thick. And then this light it just rolled through the place. His laugh got louder. And with that flash of light, everyone disappeared. I mean, even in that empty room, his laugh still echoed for a while until it eventually faded and then disappeared. The heavy pressure, that lifted from the room as well. And Frankie and I, now everything's gone. So Frankie and I went down into the main area just to check everything out, but there wasn't anything left behind. There was nothing. There was nothing else we could do here at this point. So after we finished scoping out the place, we head back to the house. And when we get there, Amy is almost like a different person. The clouds have now lifted and there's no more rain or anything. And it would appear that we have been able to create the change that we set out to do, and that's a great thing for Amy. However, we're all still very disturbed about what we know is still out there. I mean, where did they all go? When will they come back and for whom? I can see, too, why the Vatican called on me, you know, at this point. This is something that's almost bewitching in a way, and they wouldn't want that to make its way into what they are. For a group, you know, that everyone thinks they have their hands in all things, they do have their limits, and with good reason. Well, we stuck around the farm for another week and there's just sort of this leftover uneasy feeling. And we did that so that we could keep an eye on that dirt cavern, but no one ever came back. I mean, and after that, it was just time for us to go. Now, after we left, Amy went on to see the dark healer and she didn't go there to get things to help more with her situation. She went there to be trained. She has Derek's family inheritance to live off of. And instead of going back into nursing, which she was used to be doing, 
she's going to try healing in a different way. She's going to take the writings of Derek's family and try to seek out the families that have been touched by this or that might be, you know, she wants to continue the work of cleansing and hopefully, hopefully try to start, even if it's in a small way, to put an end to what has been happening. And I mean, we have no real reason to believe in all reality that the black eyes are gone for good. They seem to always pop up and have for many, many years. And that all leaves us with another certainty that the work with the black eyes will come around again. Until this is taken care of, it will always be out there. We can only do our best to try again the next time. Well, we left there with the stone block pentagon, and we also took the book of logs, the book that documented all the evil doings of the black eyes over the years. And I ended up taking those items to the Vatican and to the cardinal who contacted me. There was no other place I could think of for these items to be kept safe and away from anyone evil and where that harmful energy could rise up again. You know, the only place I could think of was the deep Vatican archives. And the Cardinal agreed, and he did keep the items. All we could do after that was wait until if and when this all came back, until they came back on the hunt for their new victim. There are so many urban legends out there, and they're fun, you know, entertaining. But these same things often stem from something real, an event or a person, a haunting, something from out of this world. Could be many things. You know, what we like to entertain ourselves with may actually be destroying someone else's life somewhere else. But you know, like all things, we tend to avoid the serious. We like the instant gratification, the entertainment, the things that come easy to us. We don't want to really look at the truth. We don't want to really and truly be scared. We don't want to really and truly have to face anything evil or hurtful. We just want to go about our lives, do what we enjoy, and then do it again the next day. We want what we want, and it's almost as if we just don't want to be bothered with anything else. But the whole thing does make you wonder, you know, some of the things that happen in the world today, what will some of them turn into at a later time? Will they become something of campfire stories too? Things that nobody really understands, but they're entertained by? Who knows? I hope you enjoyed this vlog. Like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you know when I post next. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, and I will talk to you all soon. And okay, that's a wrap. See you all next time.